Chapter 11. The Number 7. Coming more specifically to the pagan use of the number 7 as a sacred number, we pick up the trail definitely at Babylon, where astrology taught that the fate of mankind was ever decided by the position of the seven planets in the various houses of the zodiac. In order to properly understand this subject, we must know the general nature of the Babylonian astrological scheme, a system of worship based upon the placation of the seven demon gods which Babylon and her successors taught decreed all the evils which come on mankind. The zodiac is a narrow band about 18 degrees wide, making a complete circuit of the sky around the earth. The seven planets travel through this band at varying speeds. The moon makes the complete circuit once each month. Mercury, once each 88 days. Venus, 224 days. The sun, at least so it appeared to the ancients, 365 days. Mars, 687 days. Jupiter, almost 12 years. And Saturn, old father time, Kronos, or whatever you wish to call him, is the slowest of all, taking about 29.5 years to make the trip. Many have been puzzled over the Babylonian planetary lists in which the sun is the central planet in the list, instead of at the beginning, as in the days of the week. The reason for the Babylonian arrangement lies in the order in which each completes its circuit, for we note that Babylonian lists follow the same order just given. The zodiacal band itself was divided into twelve houses, one for each month of the year, and each house was divided into three rooms, making thirty-six rooms in all, one for each ten of the zodiacal circle. The zodiac was thus a heavenly clock, which measured out the months and seasons of the year, and there can be little doubt that our twelve-hour clock face is based upon the twelve-house zodiac. The entire remainder of the sky outside of the zodiacal band was divided into 36 constellations, 15 on the south side and 21 on the north side, and the god of each constellation was appointed to rule over one of the 36 rooms of the zodiac. Thus we see that every star in the sky, each considered as a god and the abode of departed spirits, was included in a constellation over whom was appointed a god who ruled over a zodiacal room. Each zodiacal house god thus had three room gods under him. The twelve house gods each ruled over a month of the year, and the seven planetary gods regulated according to astrology the affairs of mankind by their relative positions in the various rooms of the zodiac. Over them all ruled the sun god, who was considered the central fire from which each had sprung, all the gods of the sky being but emanations in the Babylonian scheme of the sun, the god one or heavenly bull which we have already discussed. Since the zodiacal circle reaches completely around the earth, it follows that six of the zodiacal house gods belong to the upper sky or light part of the day, and six belong to the underworld or dark part of the day. The six gods of the day were therefore associated with light, life, and the good things of man's existence, while the six belonging to the underworld were associated with darkness, death, and the misfortunes of mankind. The former, of course, being considered masculine and the latter feminine, though every god in the Babylonian scheme appears to have been both good and evil, the duality ever being in evidence. The seven planets were assigned to rule over the seven days of the week, the sun, or the most important god, receiving the first day, the moon the second day, and so on up to Saturn who received the last or seventh day of the week. Those who think that Babylon has little influence in our day might do well to remember that our present day names have descended to us straight from Babylon, with the same planet for each as assigned anciently, though of course the actual names of the planets vary in the different languages of the world. The main proof for the astrological influence upon mankind 
seems to have centred in the fact that the moon has its monthly periods, which were thought to regulate the fertility cycle of human beings. Astrologers carefully consulted their charts at the birth of every child, not only to ascertain the house and room in which he was born, but they also carefully recorded the hour and minute of his birth in order to decide which of the seven planets was to control his life. The seven planets were assigned also to rule over the twelve months of the year, and by an elaborate system the astrologer could tell which planet was ruling at the given moment of a child's birth. Every individual was thus marked at birth as being a Mars type, a Saturn type, etc., and from there on out his fate, his fortune or misfortune, his health or sickness, his fertility or sterility, were all controlled for him by the stars. Astrologers kept track of all the happenings on the earth, whether storm, flood, earthquake, destructive fires, lightning strikes, ships sinking, disease, births and deaths, and compiled elaborate tables in order to predict the future from the past. All forms of prognostication seem to have been directly based upon astrology, each person was a planetary type. The proponents of palmistry looked for and still do in the present systems, the markings in the seven planetary regions of the palm. The phrenologists, meanwhile, were examining the bumps on the head to ascertain which bumps were prominent in which planetary regions. The physiognomists, meanwhile, read character by the planetary bumps on the face. The old books are still found showing the planets assigned to each. Those who read tea leaves, the entrails of animals, the flight of birds, or even the buzzing of the bees, seem ever to have used astrology in interpreting their findings. If anyone thinks that astrology has not had a continuous and well-nigh all-powerful influence since the time of Babylon, he should examine the art and architecture, the literature and religious rituals, the symbols and vestments of all peoples, though all, as we have said, have not believed in astrology as a controlling factor. The gods of astrology appear to have become the gods of the entire pagan world. The idols, images and symbols revered by the devotees may have been considered by the ignorant as actual gods, but it has ever been the teaching of learned pagan doctors that these are but representations of the gods of the sky and chief among these representations are ever found the seven planets which were pictured by astrology as serpents crawling back and forth through the zodiacal band since the rotation of the planets around the sun makes their path appear to be serpentine. These seven evil gods were Jupiter, whom the Babylonians called Marduk, Mercury, Nabu, Mars, Nergal, Sun, Shamash, Though each of the planetary names is at times applied to the sun, were flesh of his flesh. Moon, Sin, Saturn, Ninib, Venus, Ishtar. Each had his sacred metal, his sacred colour, his sacred animal, his sacred bird and his sacred tree. And this symbolism runs throughout all paganism. Our present day names are merely the Anglo-Saxon names for these same gods, who took over the rulership of the days in the following order. Sun, Sunday, Moon, Moonday, Mars, Tuesco, Tuesday, Mercury, Woden, Wednesday, Jupiter, Thor, Thursday, Venus, Freya, whom the Latins called Virgo, the Virgin, Friday, Saturn, Saturday. Another way of picturing these seven evil-decreeing planetary gods was as a giant serpent of the sky whose seven heads are yoked on his seven necks, according to Babylonian texts. The central head representing the sun, the god one or god of the hoofs, horns, tail and lightning bolt of all paganism, and all the other planets and stars of the sky, were considered as emanations of this central and all-controlling deity. Over and over again we read in Babylonian texts that these gods were evil, that they know no mercy or kindness. Almost the whole of Chaldean magic and religion, we are told, 
centred around the placation of these seven evil deities. Some of the titles borne by this great serpent of seven heads throw much light upon pagan gods in general and upon biblical statements that all the gods of paganism are but representative of evil spirits or Lucifer, the god behind all false gods and the god whom all the world worships. These seven evil gods are specifically referred to in Babylonian texts as the throne-bearers of the gods, throne-bearers of the goddess of Hades, messengers of Anu their king. Anu is variously considered as the sun, as the heavens deified, and as the father god behind all the other gods. Messengers of the pest demon, messengers of the plague demon, and seven evil consuming spirits. With the titles before us, it is small wonder that the revelator identifies the seven-headed dragon which he saw in the heavens with that old serpent, the devil. It is interesting to note that the revelator saw a seven-headed dragon not only in the skies, but also upon the earth. One Babylonian text speaking of these seven evil gods and seven evil consuming spirits thus in heaven they are seven. In heaven are they seven, in earth are they seven. It would appear that these seven throne bearers of the other pagan deities had their representatives or representations on the earth. Let us examine the evidence. The Babylonians built their temple towers in seven steps and dedicated each step or setback to one of the seven planets. We further read that Anu prepared the seven mansions of the great gods. He fixed the stars, even the twin stars, to correspond to them. He ordained the year, appointed the signs of the zodiac over it. For each of the twelve months he fixed three stars. Other texts say three constellations, from the day when the year issues forth to the close. The human body was associated with the seven planets and we find mention of the seven gates of the body, just as the macropropos above was supposed to have seven gates or openings through which the soul passed in its journey from planet to planet. The secret societies use a skull to symbolise the seven planets because they tell us of its seven openings, ears, eyes, mouth, nose and spinal cord. If the Babylonians did not consider the journey of the initiate up through the seven planetary stages of the temple as a type of the immortal soul's journey through these same planets or seven heavens toward the abode of the blessed, at least those who followed them had this idea. We find the concept in Egypt, Greece, Rome, India and very pronounced in the religion of the secret societies, all of whom have the candidate ascending by seven steps. The Medes built the city of Agbana in seven circles, one within the other, coating each of the walls with the same sacred colours assigned to the seven planets in Babylon. Angro Mangest, the Persian sun god of night or lord of the underworld, is accompanied by six archdemons and Persia's seven demon gods have names closely resembling the Babylonian planetary names. Mithraism, that form of Babylonian demon worship which passed through Persia before it became the official religion of Rome about the time of Christ, had seven degrees of initiations. On the sixth, the candidate received the title of son, on the seventh he received the title of father, and the head of the entire system was called the father of fathers. Of this astrological religion we read, there was a close rapprochement between the Babylonian and the Persian cults. When we find the busts of the sun and moon, and the circle of the zodiac standing features in Mithraic monuments, we can have no doubt as to the ultimate source of this element. The body of doctrine also took place in the farther east. The doctrine of the destiny of the individual soul and the results which flowed from such doctrine were worked out in detail on the banks of the Euphrates. Greece, the whole realm of Greek mythology around which her religion was centred, is intimately bound out with astrology and the worship of the sun, moon and stars. 
Hercules represented the sun, and each of the other planets had its deity name. Hydra was often pictured as a seven-headed dragon. The Gnostics were a Greek sect, and an examination of their amulets and other remains shows how minutely the worship of the dragon was still being carried on in their day. Since at the time of Christ, the religion of Greece and Rome were fused into one, we cannot discuss the one without discussing the other. Rome. Rome joined the procession of the nations doing honour to Babylon's seven planetary deities, gathering up all the threads of demon worship and weaving them into a fabric that became the state religion. The seven pipes of Pan, the Greek-Roman All-God, the God who with his hoofs, horns and tail, represented by his name the concepts of all gods in one, the seven pipes represented the seven planets. We find that each of the famous seven hills of Rome had on it a temple dedicated to some deity, and that at least some of these hills bore planetary names in their early history. In some of the pagan festivals, the devotees journeyed from temple to temple, and there can be little doubt that in these journeys the Romans were following the same pattern as that followed by the worshippers of the seven planetary dragon of Babylon when they ascended through their seven temple stages. All scholars seem to agree that the crown of seven rays found so frequently on Greek, Roman and Gnostic gods represent the seven planets. It is interesting to note that when Constantine, an ardent votary of the sun, moved his capital from the seven-hilled city of Rome, he sought out a site which should, like Rome, have seven hills. He found this site in the ancient seven-hilled city of Byzantium, renaming the city after himself and erecting on the main street of the city a statue of himself in the guise of Apollo, crowned by a seven-rayed halo. We have already pointed out that the Mithraic cult was intimately associated with astrology, the zodiac, and the seven planetary deities, and that Mithraism became the official religion of Rome. It is indeed worthy of note that John the Revelator declares that the seven heads on which the fallen church was to sit are seven hills or mountains, and that both branches of Catholicism, the Eastern and Western churches, should each be ruled or directed from cities founded on seven hills. The doctrines of the two branches of the great mother church are essentially the same, and the Pope of Rome has from the beginning claimed jurisdiction over both Eastern and Western Catholicism. The Orient. In the Orient today there are multitudinous proofs that the seven-headed dragon has ever been the chief deity. In the ruins of Angkor, Cambodia, there are found to this day giant seven-headed stone serpents, some of them with bodies hundreds of feet long and completely surrounding the temples. Hamilton tells us that here Brahmanic and Buddhist ideals are preserved side by side. Everywhere lifted above the vegetation you meet the cobra's cowl, the sacred seven-headed naga, its fan-shaped hood erect, the genius of Angkor. Sometimes it forms an immense horizontal balustrade, supported by squat arches, its head the newel, or it rises lifelike from the centre of a tank. Rows of them guard the terraces and causeways of Angkor and figure on the friezes. But Angkor is not an isolated instance of a city devoted to the worship of Lucifer in this form. Juggernaut, the most famous god of India, is frequently represented as a seven-headed demon dragon. His images sometimes have horns and are as ugly as can be conceived, showing unmistakable demon connections. One of his titles is Lord of the World. The Smithsonian Institute of Washington, D.C. has an image of Krishna, another popular Indian deity, seated on a seven-headed serpent, with the serpent heads forming a canopy over him. Naga and Vishnu also are sometimes found thus canopied. Buddhism is just another form of devotion to the seven-headed dragon. Buddha himself is sometimes pictured with seven heads and a thousand arms, making a complete circle and representing the sun's rays. 
The Golden Gate Museum at San Francisco has a Buddha seated on a seven-headed serpent, with the heads forming a canopy over him. And according to Buddhist tradition, a seven-headed serpent hovered over the historical Buddha and shaded him from the sun while he was meditating on his new religion. And on his eighth reincarnation, Buddha is supposed to become a seven-headed serpent. Egypt. Egyptian texts mention the seven-headed serpent, and the Egyptian religion from beginning to the end shows a close affiliation with the zodiac and the worship of the seven-headed dragon. American Indians. It comes as a surprise to many, particularly to those who have received their schooling under evolutionary scholars. They teach that the various pagan religions of the world are separately evolved, and that similarity among them is pure coincidence. They come from the fact that men's minds work the same way the world over. We say that it comes as a surprise to these surface researchers to find the zodiac among the American Indians with essentially the same animals connected with each sign as in the old world. The signs of the zodiac were assigned to various parts of the body just as elsewhere, and a pyramid with seven setbacks was dedicated to the seven snake. The feather workers of Mexico worshipped seven patron deities, and these deities, or at least some of them, were considered as demons. Another Mexican Indian deity was Chicami Zocitl, a god whose name means the seven flower. This sun god, we read, was pictured with two long unbranched snake-like horns, a long tail, and human hands and feet. The Zuni Indians of New Mexico had seven great gods who composed the council of the gods. That these deities, like those of Babylon, were connected with Lucifer as the ruler of the underworld is evidenced by the fact that they were supposed to reside in the bottom of a lake. Arabia. The tradition of the seven planetary gods of Babylon is carried on in Arabia today. Arabian amulets often are found inscribed with the names of the planets, and others are dedicated to the seven kings of the genii. With the admixture of Christianity and paganism in Arabia, we find the usual renaming of pagan deities with Christian names. The powers of the seven planetary deities are reassigned to seven prophets, Moses, Jesus, David, Solomon, Jacob, Adam and Muhammad, each of whom presides over his particular day of the week. Mesopotamia today. One of the most outstanding remnants of Babylon's allegiance to the seven-headed dragon is still to be found today in Mesopotamia, the original home of demon worship. The Yezidis of Iraq, who claim to be descendants of the ancient Babylonians, worship seven devils in the form of the peacock. They identify these seven gods with the planets, declaring that Lucifer, whom they identify with Venus, is the chief of the seven. They worship the sun and the serpent, keep the sun day, have holy water, saints, relics, images, candles, infant baptism, pilgrimages, blessed charms and penances. They are ruled over by a prince-pope whom they consider infallible, though he is much given to alcohol and drug addiction. The worshippers daily kiss the hands of the priests and pray to seven deified saints who are the mediators between themselves and their god. They make offering to and for the dead and call the god of the underworld Father. One of their poems of praise to the devil declares, I am he that men worship in my glory, coming to me and kissing my feet. I am he that caused Nimrod to inhabit a hot burning fire. Though but a few of the Yezidi teachings are given here, these are sufficient to show that somebody has copied somebody and that the worship of the Babylonian seven-headed dragon did not die with Babylon. Miscellaneous. The Phoenicians worshipped seven misshapen dwarfish deities like the gnomes in the Scandinavian and Teutonic mythologies. One of these seven deities was the sun. He was pictured with horns on his head and a serpent under one arm. 
the common altar on Cyprus where Paul and Barnabas first began their foreign missionary work consisted of a pole on top of which was a seven-rayed globe. In Bali today, seven-headed serpent designs are found over their demon gods, and in many places in the Orient, here and there in the background, one finds open worship of seven-headed serpent images, though usually this allegiance to the devil is somewhat more refined and camouflaged. We have already pointed out that the cross was one of the forms of the stigma and that it was one of the idols representing the sun and Lucifer long before the coming of Christ. Among the icons or idols of Witoba, in Moore's Pantheon at the British Museum, there was formerly a figure with a heart on his breast, round marks on hands and feet indicating crucifixion, and a hollow interior which opened up to reveal a seven-headed naga inside. Crucifixion, it must be remembered, was not a Christian institution, nor did it originate with Christ. The American Indians pictured gods on crosses before the coming of the white men, and there is considerable evidence that such representations are found in the world also before the time of Christ. Since crucifixion was one of the most cruel methods of administering the death penalty ever invented, and since the cross appears to have been an actual idol representing the sun and Lucifer, it is not surprising that long before the coming of Christ, the prince of devils should have his plans all laid as to the method he would use on the Redeemer when he should come under the destroyer's power. We would also expect him to establish, since he knew all about the plan of salvation, counterfeits and symbols which would bring discredit upon Christianity and neutralise its influence wherever possible. One of the most clever of his plans, without a doubt, was the instigating of the worship of the cross and of a deity on a cross before the coming of the Saviour. Lucifer was that deity and the cross was his symbol. Here again is revealed the ever-present plan of Lucifer to identify himself with the Creator, to substitute his worship for that of worship to God. If symbolism means anything, the placing of a seven-headed naga inside a crucified deity signifies that the worship of a dead, crucified God in the form of an image is in reality giving one's allegiance to the seven-headed dragon. Christ is no longer dead. He has long since ascended to heaven. We believe that the evidence is sufficiently strong to convince anyone that any veneration of six or seven, any ritual in which these numbers play a part in symbolism, is in reality the worship of the serpent who is the throne-bearer of all the other gods of paganism. Since the compilation of the above material on the number seven, a copy of the fundamental principles of old and new world civilizations, Nuttall, published by the Peabody Museum of Harvard, 1901, has come to hand. From this work we glean the following. Many of the races of the world, both the old and the new, claimed descent from a divine seven. Governments and religious organisations were patterned after this sacred number and frequently the geographical divisions of countries were made to correspond with the astrological divisions of the heaven. Many countries had seven divisions and the rulers of these divisions were associated with the seven divinities. Hindus consider the number seven as a symbol of cosmos or the universe, giving it seven directions north, south, east, west, up, down, and here. The American Indians also seem to have followed this same seven division of cosmos. The author points out that the seven stars of Ursa Major, the Big Bear, and Ursa Minor, as well as the seven stars of the Pleiades, seem all to be related, each a sort of duplication of the seven god. One of their Mexican deities was Chihuacotl, Woman Serpent, a deity who also bore the title Chikomikotl, Seven Serpents. Another god bore the name Ahuachapat, Serpent with Seven Heads, page 181. There is also a reference to a Lord of Seven, page 249. 
The Chinese call Ursa Major the Seven Directors, page 285, a title which appears to associate these stars with the seven planets. Both the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Hindus had a seven-day week, with the names of the days corresponding with the names of the planets, the same as today, pages 300 and 301. The same seven-day period has been employed in China from time immemorial, the seventh day being marked by a character which means quiet, secret or silent. Here, as everywhere else where astrology ruled, the days were dedicated to the planets, page 303. In Egypt, Ra meant not only the sun but also, apparently, the seven planets, page 390. Athena, the name of the Grecian goddess, state and capital, means seven, page 573, 